Intellectual Property Creation and Management for Emerging Growth Technology Companies. Intellectual Property Valuation. This presentation is brought to you by the IP attorneys and professionals at Halsey Intellectual Property Lawyers through the Halsey Intellectual Property Technology and Invention Monitor website. Halsey Intellectual Property Lawyers. IP professionals for entrepreneurship's new golden age. This presentation is part of the Technology and Invention Monitor website's Legal and Business Issues and Instructions resource. Intellectual Property Creation and Management for Emerging Growth Technology Companies. Intellectual Property Valuation. Let's begin the presentation. As you can see from the diagram, it is part of the system and the, de the decisions relating to the valuation of intellectual property rights and the actual act of valuation uh, the circle indicating decisions to be made and then the valuation of the actual act itself um, are part and parcel of what makes a system work and can be, it's, it's not necessarily black magic, certainly there are a lot of uncertainties in the valuation of intellectual property rights, but there are processes and there are techniques that can be used and are used repeatedly for the purpose of determining how much value should be assigned to an intellectual property right. I suppose before we begin anything, the uh, one of the fundamental tenets that I maintain is that intellectual property has no value unless there's an associated revenue stream or the protection of a revenue stream arising from the intellectual property or relating to the product sales or the ability to make product sales, no value other than the aesthetic or the historical or the uh, non-financial value. For semiconductor and related industries, the intellectual property that is of most interest is those that actually protect revenue streams. Valuation of intellectual property relates to the economic benefit that derives from the intellectual property relates to the duration of the benefit, and also relates to the risk of receiving the benefit. What can affect adversely the ability to maintain the revenue stream that the intellectual property represents? One of the first things to understand, though, in the development of an understanding of intellectual property valuation is to understand the context of the valuation exercise or just how people or how a company might choose to value. At what point in time is the evaluation analysis occurring? You might look at the evaluation analysis as occurring in three different contexts. One is a pre-commercialization sort of what-if type of background or what-if what type of environment. A pre-negotiation, you've got a pretty clear idea of what the intellectual property is. You've got a pretty clear idea of what the rights are that you're protecting. And so there's a little more rigor that goes into the process. And then finally, litigation, where you're engaging experts, economic experts, technical experts, market experts, for the purpose of not only dealing with the revenue streams, understanding the revenue streams, but also identifying the market, also identifying the presence or absence of lost profits that might have occurred on the part of the um, patent right holder, the intellectual property right holder, as a result of the infringing activity that a infringer has perpetrated. The pre-commercialization stage is an assessment stage where information is scarce, resources are limited, and the riskiness of an endeavor is very high. Pre-commercialization, oftentimes you will find this type of analysis being done in the early stage investment or angel investment into a startup company, uh, less more so now than before, but venture capitalists might, in, might invest in a pre-commercialization stage of a particular technology or particular uh, intellectual property. Uh, royalty rate determinations are useful for determining the value of intellectual property rights in the pre-commercialization stage. Uh, a rule that's used by many in determining the value of the intellectual property rights is uh, to determine 25% of the profit that a company generates may be attributable to the intellectual property 
But there, the, the market approach is another approach that's used for determining the value of intellectual property rights. The market approach being what most people are familiar with in the real estate market, for example, of providing or identifying comparables, comparable intellectual property rights, comparable licensing scenarios that would indicate what the value of the intellectual property is based on industry norms or based on similar uh, transactions. Uh, return of sales, uh, what type of return on sales, what type of uh, success ha has the company received, and what are those sales, if those sales are substantially due to the unique position that an intellectual property will provide for the company selling the product or service, then the return on sales, a percentage of the return on sales, like the 25% rule, is a, uh, is a measure. And then others might use at this pre-commercialization stage a return on essentially research and development cost. What did it cost to develop the technology and how rapidly can we recoup those costs in terms of the valuation? These are all less than ultimately desirable rules, but they at least can sometimes provide ballpark estimates. Prior to commercialization is the stage in which oftentimes patent applications will be filed. And in the pre-commercialization stage, we talked about the decisions to make the patent filing. But this diagram shows examples of the value proposition, the patent value formula factors that might be determinative in, determining, in making the decision of whether or not to file a patent, and it's essentially a formula that says that the potential value of a patent may be multiplied by the probability of realizing the value, incorporating some risk associated or a development of a parameter for uncertainty. If that product is greater than the cost of obtaining the patent, the cost to get the patent in the first place, the cost to secure, to enforce the patent, or the cost to maintain and explore the patent, if those costs considering the very different stages of this process, if you look at these considerations, such as the potential value of the exclusive rights, uh, the value of being able to enforce the patent against infringers, cross-licensing value, some of the other things that we've talked about already, grant-back licensing value, improved bargaining posture, the ability to recruit the research and development costs, the use of the patent pending label, the mystique that we've talked about further, the effect on competitive designs, enhanced market control, the ability to buffer your company products and have an intellectual property barrier about them. Extending the product life is maybe a, a, something that would be valuable for a benefit that would be derived from obtaining the patent. Uh, collateral, intellectual property is an asset in and of itself. And to the degree that there is a, uh, to the degree that there is a revenue stream associated with that, the active, the value of that protection itself can be used for security for loan, security for financing, and may be collateral for that purpose. Strong technological appearance for shareholders. Again, one of the motivations we've talked about with patent. If you match that against the risk, some of the probabilities, uh, the fact, factors that affect the probability of obtaining patents, looking at current customer, dem customer demand, is that going to continue? Customer receptiveness to new, de to te new technology, the availability of commercially acceptable alternatives, the solution to long-felt need in the industry, pricing considerations, profit margins, additional, additional costs, practice the invention. This is the complementary assets issue that we talked about potential customer base, the range of the customer worth, the scope of protection, identifiable licensees, actually gut feeling. When you put these parameters together, the risk and uncertainties together with the values, if they are greater than obtaining the patent, then at the pre-commercialization stage in the valuation of intellectual property, at least that valuation, this valuation, which is fuzzy at best, is something that can help guide a decision. The pre-negotiation context, now you've got a license agreement that you're concerned about. You have a transaction that you're, con that you're addressing. Uh, standard factors begin to emerge. Licensing terms and competitive advantage becomes more of a focus. Cost savings, technolo technology maturity. You start to calculate these things and look at these things and determine uh, what effect the, the uh, value, these factors will have on the value 
of the intellectual property rights. Legal protection, commercial success, these are looked at in ways that in the pre-commercialization state are not often looked at in great detail, but now as we move into the pre-negotiation stage, we're looking at more carefully. The royalty rate determination is usually done by what is known the, as the income approach, and we'll spend a few minutes talking about that. As I mentioned, the litigation context is when we are become careful and precision emerges Economic damages calculations are made. Experienced patent attorneys, economists, licensing experts arise because a bet the business or I'm not going to lose this or I'm going to get you mentality arises in the litigation context. I will win. Mentality arises, often exists, and no holds are barred often in the use of resources for making the damages calculations. Again, the royalty rate determinations based oftentimes on the income approach. What is the present value of an income stream derived from the intellectual property right? Or we may get into the determination of lost profits by that, by virtue of, by that I mean that the profits that the holder of the intellectual property rights would have made had the infringer not infringed are the property and should be given to the holder of the intellectual property rights. And these royalty rate determinations and these profit rates determinations are made in the litigation context. There are three generally accepted approaches to valuing intellectual property. One is known as the cost approach, one is known as the market approach, and the third is the income approach. We've touched on the cost approach to some degree, essentially, is what did it cost to develop this innovation? The market approach, like in the real estate industry, what are the costs for obtaining uh, this in the open market? What is the fair market price, if you will, for this technology or this ability to generate or to use the technology? And then the income approach is one that deals with the realization of the income that the intellectual property makes possible and attributing that increased income or that difference in income that the intellectual property makes possible uh, to the value of the intellectual property itself. The cost approach, there are general cost approach principles that are applied. Depreciation is a factor. And for this work, uh, it's, it's probably beyond the scope of what we're talking about here to get into much detail into the analysis of the intellectual property valuations. But I would refer you to the uh, evaluation of Intangible Assets, book written by Patrick Sullivan, which is, and uh, Russell Parr, and, and Patrick Sullivan, which is a, I think, the authoritative text on the evaluation of intellectual property rights. The depreciation of these rights, uh, the depreciation of the value of the underlying technology or asset is uh, considered in the cost approach. Cost versus value is not contemplated in the cost approach, and that's its major failing, is that the uh, example that comes to mind so frequently is the uh, 3M Post-it note. That was an invention that has yielded many millions of dollars for the 3M Corporation, for which the adhesive was essentially a mistake. It was a poor adhesive. It was one developed. Uh, by one of the research and development engineers or chemists in the company for the purpose of all things to help uh, hold a marker on the pages of his uh, choir hymnal. And that adhesive was not accepted by the company originally. Somehow, some way along the way, they decided to give this product a try. And what we end up with is it's hard to be in any place, any desk, and not look around and find a post-it note, uh, the cost for developing that was very low. The value was tremendous. It continues to be tremendous. And for that reason, the, using the cost approach would give a inappropriate value to the intellectual property that the chemical compound in the 3M post-it note represents. Applying the cost approach to intellectual property is something that can work but again, it disregards the value that the intellectual property provides. Intellectual property at the same time, oftentimes in the development of new technologies, uh, the 
the effort leads to blind alleys, leads to uh, so efforts that don't work, and it's those efforts that don't work that have value, but the cost in developing the innovation, particularly where it's an intellectual property rich in innovation, may be much higher or insignificant relative to what the value of the intellectual property is. And so those are the some of the cautions associated with the cost approach. The market approach bases itself on comparability. But what it fails to consider, the market approach fails to consider, is the com complementary asset investment that a company needs to make in order to, in, in order to make it a technology useful. And that complementary assets, remember I talked about that in terms of the property, plant, equipment that a company needs in order to use an innovation or use a technology. If the market approach simply uses comparables in the marketplace, more likely than not, the market approach will not consider the investment or the effect that investing in complementary assets will have on the value or the cost of the technology to the company or the actual sale of that technology and the products that it makes. So it, it leads, to a, uh, leads to a skewed result in, in, in many ways. Uh, cautions in using the market approach are that it's often difficult, if not impossible, with regard to intellectual property to find market comparables. Think about it. The reason that a patent is granted is because the invention is unique. And in an effort, if in an effort to determine the value of an intellectual property, you're seeking comparable inventions, that it's logically inconsistent with what gives the patent value itself. The patent receives value for the fact that it's unique. The patent is uh, not value. It, you can't value the patent using comparables, because if there are comparables, then the patent is not protect a unique convention. And so those are some considerations that relate to the market approach. The income approach is perhaps a better calculator or a better tool to use in the valuation of intellectual property rights because it considers the net cash flow, considers the economic climates, the risk factors associated with developing the revenue streams. It considers the profitability of the company. It takes into consideration how the company is successful in generating that revenue vis-a-vis -vis its competitors. It like, takes into consideration issues such as the duration of the cash flow. How long can the um, how long can the revenue stream be exacted? And for those reasons, the uh, it's it's useful to use the income approach. One of the income approaches is called the investment rate of return analysis. It is one of the uh, types of income approach. It's based on the investment rate of returns from the exploitation of the company's assets, including the intangible assets and the intellectual property. So based on what the company's assets are, working capital, its tangible assets, its intangible assets, and its intellectual property, the investment rate of return approach can lead to a, an analysis of a essentially royalty rate or differential revenue stream that is more clearly indicative of the value associated with the intellectual property. Some of the basic principles applied in the investment rate of return analysis are to identify the total profits of the business, to allocate the, profit, the profits among the different classes of assets that the company uses to develop its profits. If there are higher than expected profit as a result of the position that the company occupies than the intangible assets and intellectual property associated with those higher than expected profits, those greater than commodity profit margin, can then be identified. The process then attributes a portion of those higher than expected profits to the intangible assets and intellectual property of the company, and then further expresses those the percentage of the profit as a percentage of revenues to yield a royalty rate. The analyses are fairly straightforward, and at the same time, they can lead to a way to determine what added value that intellectual property uh, provides. The benefits of the investment rate of return analysis as an income approach is that it considers investment risk. 
It contemplates the cost of capital, and it further deals with the risk associated with conducting a business and, moreover, the risk associated with an individual business that can determine, help affect the valuation of intellectual property rights. The investment rate of return analysis further reflects the commercialization factors of the technology. What are the benefits that the technology experiences or provides and that makes it a commercially viable product? It reflects those factors the investment rate of return analysis does. And then it further allows for investment return to be earned on the fixed assets, the working capital assets, uh, and other intangible assets and intellectual property other than the specific patent or the specific piece of intellectual property under consideration. In other words, by taking out of the calculation for the investment rate of return analysis, right, and, tasting, and taking out of the calculations the return on fixed assets, which are calculated and extracted, the working capital assets and their expected return from the calculations, what you end up with are the intangible assets and intellectual property of the company. And then the process further permits the extraction from the intangible assets and intellectual properties, those which are not attributable to the particular product or particular product line that the patented technology or protected intellectual property represents. Another income approach is the discounted cash flow analysis. The discounted cash flow analysis is not as complex, neither is it as robust as the investment rate of return analysis for the valuation of intellectual property rights. However, it does convert a stream of expected income into a present value. It's based on cash together with the risk factor that the continuation of the revenue stream may not occur. But it also reflects the timing with regard to receipt of economic benefits by incorporating a risk factor. It deals with the capital expenditure investment. It deals with working capital investments. And it also can deal with the investments that are not associated with the subject technologies. And so it, it can, in fact, deal with some of these assets, but not in as complete a way as does the investment rate of return analysis. In the litigation context, the concept of lost profits versus reasonable royalty exists. The patent statutes provide a floor of royalty of damages for the infringement of intellectual property rights. And under two section, 271 of the patent statute, the reasonable royalties are established to be, uh, the damages are determined to be not less than a reasonable royalty. And there are factors that help determine what a reasonable royalty is. In fact, the income approach or the discounted cash flow can help determine, analyses can help determine what the reasonable royalty is. But there's also the concept of lost profits. And in the Panduit versus Stalin Five Brothers Fiber Works case, four salient factors emerged that determined what lost profits, when lost profits should be awarded. Those lost profits can be awarded when the patent holder can show that there was an existing demand for the products that he sold that there were no non-infringing substitutes. In other words, they all substitutes for the products that were sold by the patent holder were necessarily infringing substitutes. And because there could not be any, the patent claims were sufficiently broad or sufficiently relevant that to what were being sold, that there were not non-infringing substitutes and this is, if this factor is shown, then the second factor of the Panduit analysis is proven. The patentee, the patent holder, also must show that it had the opportunity, the ability to manufacture the products that were sold, that it had the necessary manufacturing capability and the necessary marketing capacity to make the products that were sold by the infringer. And further, the last test is that the damages, the profits made by the infringer can be quantified. If the patent holder can show these things, then the lost profits that the patent holder experienced by virtue of the infringer selling his products can be received by the patent holder. Some of the things that go into the lost profits determination include the patent owner's profit margin, 
times the number of units sold by the infringer. So the infringer may make less profit than the patent holder, but what the profit margin is determined to be by the patent owner is multiplied by the number of units sold by the infringer, and that's the measure that is used for the lost profits calculation. But there are additional factors that can be added to the lost profits determination, and one of those is the price erosion. Price erosion in the profits that the patent holder experienced because his market was saturated or otherwise adversely affected by the infringer are, are included in the calculation of the damages, the lost profits. And the way that that is determined is to take the price that would be, it would have occurred absent the infringer's product and make that calculation minus the lower price to compete with the infringer, that difference, which will be a positive difference, and you multiply that times the number of sold, and that price erosion will be added to the lost profits determination that exists by virtue of, num of counting the profit margin, the per unit profit margin times the, um, the numbers sold. And then finally, the lost sales of accompanying product. Very often it's the case that a product will be sold and that there will be accompanying products that could be sold. And in the event, for example, uh, ink cartridge for a printer or a supply for a product that, has, that is patented in that product itself was shown to be the infringement of the patent covering that product was shown to be appropriate for lost damages calculations. The lost sales on the accompanying product can be calculated by virtue of the patent owner's profit margin on the related products, again multiplied by the number of units sold, and further to the degree that there may have been some price erosion on the sale of accompanying products, that too can be added. So the numbers can be fairly large in the lost profits formula determination. Now if a lost profits determination cannot be obtained, some of the litigation factors in determining what are reasonable royalties can be seen through the landmark case of Georgia Pacific Corporation versus United States Plywood Corporation. And what the qualitative factors that case enunciates are relevant in determining what is a reasonable royalty. And, that, and I'll just recite them here. The proof of established royalty, the rates paid by the licensee for other patents, the nature and scope of the license that would be obtained, the licensor's established policy regarding licenses, licensing and intellectual property rights that can affect the, what is reasonable and what is not, the commercial relationship between the licensor and the licensee, the licensor's derivative or convoyed sales, the related sales, in the printer and cartridge example, for example, um, the patent duration and the license term that might be established for determining reasonable royalty, the protected product's profitability, and the commercial success or popularity of the product that is covered by patent and infringed, the advantage of patented product over the prior products. If it's only a small increase or a small improvement, then that will operate to reduce the royalty. If it's a substantial increase, over prior products, that can increase the royalty. The nature of the invention and the benefits to its users, the extent of the infringing use, is it just one use or is it a ubiquitous infringement of the rights of the patent holder? Uh, what are the industry norms for royalty rates? This sounds like the market approach, but again, it goes into the determination of what is a reasonable royalty, and courts looked at this in the instance of intellectual property infringement. The portion of profits creditable to the IP rights income approach. This is an aspect of the income approach, and some of those calculations are used for litigation. Expert testimony. Here we're engaging economists and to determine what the market is of the product and determining the damage that the infringement occasioned on the market. And then the hypothetical arm's length transaction. All of this is hypothetical in determining what the reasonable royalty is but they are factors that courts use. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, actually the Court of Claims, uh, issued this in the 1970 Georgia Pacific case, and they've been valid determiners in intellectual property litigation 
of what is a reasonable royalty in the event that the patent owner is not able to achieve a lost profits determination. And this final table gives a comparison to the different types of approaches that we've discussed and also includes uh, the includes the market approach, the income approach, the cost approach, the technology factor approach. Now this is an interesting one. This is one that was used by Gordon Petrash, if you remember, in one of the prior modules to talk about the uh, valuation of the technology of the patents that, that Dow Chemical owned, and the probability or adjusted expected value. Uh, this is one that further deals with uncertainty. But going through here, the table describes the description, the advantages, the disadvantages, and when these different approaches are used. The description, the market is the economist's basic valuation method, and that's why it's used even yet in the context of intellectual property rights. Its advantage is the best match with the economist's definition of value, but again, we're dealing with unique rights, so there's some challenges. And the disadvantages is the difficulty in finding comparable intellectual property rights. We're using the market approach both in litigation, uh, in litigation as well as in licensing and in transactions. The income approach is a basic technique. There are many variations. The income rate of return, the discounted cash flow, the quantities, cost, and income streams are used. Considered the best alternative if the market approach is unavailable. I think it's the best alternative uh, is essentially, and oftentimes the market approach is not available. It's difficult for a layman to calculate. Maybe so. Maybe it depends on the layman. But the calculations, I think, are relatively accessible. Receiving the advice and counsel of an economist can, in certain instances, make the calculations more accessible. It's used in litigation, licensing, and transactions. The cost approach is a calculation of what it would cost to replicate the innovation or reproduce the innovation. It's a third approach. It's not desirable when I, unless the market approach or the income approach are not available. But it may be a good method for brand new technology, perhaps if the development effort was one that had that, that achieved its a, a original intention and for which there weren't excessive blind alleys. No measure of utility or market value exists in the cost approach, and the overhead allocations are difficult to make or justify. Again, in litigation, it's considered licensing, considered in transactions. The technology factor provides a, a political consensus and provides some methodical or systematic uh, good sort of workbook way of dealing with the technology. But one of the things that, if you remember from the valuation discussion in the Dow Chemical example, it considers the value of the intellectual property rights to the strategic business unit managers. Uh, re the technology factor requires assembly of many people well, there are many assumptions underlying the method, but it does not necessarily apply to companies other than Dow. Probably so. Uh, there's some explanations of the process, but I think that it's probably useful to uh, consider the technology factor as a possible way of determining valuation. Uh, internal use only, yes, because it ties the valuation largely to the estimates of the strategic business owners and does not use external economic data. Uh, the probability adjusted expected value, again, we're dealing with uh, using risk. Uh, it allows for the quantification. It's really what we're getting into with the discounted cash flow as well as the income rate of return, the, uh, the investment rate of return model, which I think is, is uh, part of the income approach. But it provides a method to deal with the uncertainty. It allows for quantification of elements of risk and the models for the, it models the development process in the sense that it incorporates the increased revenue streams or changes in revenue streams that might be expected as a market develops. Again, like the income approach, it may be difficult to calculate, but it can be costly if done to meet high precision standards. And that's a challenge. Um, again, the income approach is and can be costly because you've got to get data to make that work. But I think it's one of the most telling indicia of value of intellectual property that's used in the litigation context. And it can be used where strategic or where position is important. I think this table, this summary table, is useful to, together with an understanding of the basic approaches. 
as well as some of the uh, viewing the intellectual, the value of intellectual property rights in terms of the context that the property exists in, and that being the pre-commercialization, the pre-negotiation, and the, uh, the litigation context. This concludes the presentation. Thank you for viewing Intellectual Property Creation and Management for Emerging Growth Technology Companies. Intellectual Property Valuation. Be sure to visit us at www.halseyiplaw.com. Halsey Intellectual Property Lawyers. IP Professionals for Entrepreneurship's New Golden Age. This is Bill Halsey.